a lot of Christians are on the dead run from what it really means to live the Christian life. And we're going to look at a passage this morning that typifies what what the Apostle Paul, who in my mind would, would probably live the most successful Christian life, what his life was all about, and, and as you look at those things, we're probably saying that most Christians are on the dead run from that kind of sacrifice. It's the last thing they want to incorporate in their life. This morning and tonight, we're going to look at three I am's of the Apostle Paul. Three things that were true in his life. That should be true in our life as well. If you ever go car shopping, if you've got the money to do those, those kinds of things, and you go new car shopping, you will see that as you're browsing through and looking at the, uh, the uh, tremendous paint jobs and the brand new uh, uh, ways the cars are, are made now as far as their design, you notice that on the window there's always a sticker. And this sticker will have a division in it, and that division will be between standard equipment and optional equipment. And the standard things would be uh, things that you're going to need on any car, and then the optional things are maybe a CD player or a... Uh, I'm not sure what option. I haven't been new car shopping in a long, long time, not since I had kids, but it uh, would be things that would be new and fresh and unique for the car market today. Well, I think Christians want to put some things that we see in the life of the Apostle Paul and the life of other great Christians in the optional col column. And people like Paul, like Jesus, people that are great leaders today would say, no, they're not optional, they're standard. They should be in every Christian's life. They should not be unique to the Billy Graham or unique to the Apostle Paul or unique to the Daniel or the Joseph, but they're meant to be a part of every Christian's life. And those three things that the Apostle Paul recognized that we should recognize and we should set our life by, the three I am's are I am a debtor. Number two, I am ready or eager. And number three, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. Three things that should be in the life of every Christian. And I think they're the reasons why we can look at the, the life of the Apostle Paul and see that he was very dynamic and did a tremendous work, or God did a tremendous work through his life. Now, if you look in the verses we're going to look at today, which verse, starts in verse 14, it says, I am under obligation, both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. Now that last, that last phrase there, that last part of verse 17, is that quote that captured the heart of Martin Luther that captured the heart of Augustine and John Wesley, people who had committed themselves to try to please God by the way they lived and didn't recognize that pleasing God was all about the righteousness that God provides through His Son, Jesus Christ. And the just man, if you're going to be right, if you're going to be just before God, that it has to be an imputed righteousness, which means it comes from outside. It's not something you develop in your own life. In fact, the word for just or righteous, the righteous man, is in the Greek, it has a, an ending that does not allow it to be earned by the, by the individual. The very ending itself was an ending that was set apart for something that was given or provided for you and then given to you from an outside source. So the very language itself says that we cannot live by the law so well that God says you deserve heaven. Every person falls short. Every person is recognized a sinner. And that's a lot of what the book of Romans is. We're going to see that, number one, God says, well, the, the Gentiles, those without God, that are, uh, that are without God's Word, they're sinners before God. We'd all agree about that. Then he goes on to say, well, the religious people are, are sinners before God. Those who have God's Word, those who know, know God's will, even they fall short. And that's what, what we find all through the first part of the book of Romans is God setting that case to the Apostle Paul that every person is a sinner. So when we get to Romans chapter 3, it will say all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. So we need to recognize who we are, and then we need to recognize what we are sharing, and then I want to share with you what these three I am's are. But we are sharing the gospel. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. 
It's, it's a word euangelion, which sounds a lot like evangelism. It's the word good news. And that was a common word in Paul's day. He didn't just, just make up some neat word that, that would fit just in this setting and that alone. It was a word that was used all over the, uh, the Greek language where it was spoken, which was all through the Roman Empire. And it was a word that would mean not just news that was pleasant, but news that was outstanding, dynamic. If, if we won a war and you came home, the news would be the war is over. That would be euangelion, exciting, dynamic news. If a couple had a baby, they would, they would, that would be euangelion. When they would say, it's a boy, that would be good news. Now, in my case, it was, it's a boy, it's a girl, it's a boy, it's a boy, it's a boy, it's a girl. And then Lynn finally said, it's enough. And we stopped right there. But all those were euangelion. Now, if, if I got the news again, I'm not sure if it'd be euangelion again, but, I mean, we'd, we'd deal with it and assume it was. But it is good news that is a cut above what normal, pleasant news would be. And... I think in the life of this church, it might be the debt is paid. That would be euangelion. That would be especially good news to hear. Well, you know, God gave this good news for the world to hear. And if God wanted to, God could have took uh, the neatest looking cloud and written it across that cloud for everybody in the world who could read, to look up there and to read the gospel, the good news, the euangelion. But God didn't do it that way. God gave it to the church and said, you go tell them. You go make this good news known. Now, usually we're excited about sharing good news. And you got news to that level of being great. You can't wait to tell as many people as, as you can find the good news. And so it's not like God's putting this big burden upon us. He's given us this great message to share with the world. But his chosen vehicle is the church. And Paul recognized that he as a leader in the church was part of that chosen vehicle. Individually, he was chosen as part, as being, as well as being part of the body of Christ. So, who we are, we're the righteous, made that way because of what Christ has accomplished for us, and we have been given this great news, this only hope that the world has to share with them. And, we, and in reaction to that, Paul says three things about himself. He says, number one, I am a debtor, I am ready, and I am not ashamed. When we capture the essence of those three things, it will take us to a brand new level in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I read this week about a violinist, a, an outstanding violinist who uh, was very capable and he, was, he had made a great fortune by playing the violin in concerts as well as composing music. And he had made a lot of money, so he was doing a lot of traveling. And he heard about, on one of his travels, a especially exquisite violin. And so he went to the person who had this violin for sale and found out this person had already sold it. And so he followed the trail to the person who had bought it from them, found out that person was a collector of violins and refused to sell him the violin. And so this man, after conversing with this collector, was, was getting up and walking out, and he said, well, can I ask one favor? He said, since this violin is never really going to be played again and it's going to be kind of collector's item, could I play it one last time before it is committed to silence? And this collector allowed him to do that, and this master of the violin picked it up and played that violin in such a way that it stirred the heart of this new owner. And after he's done, the new owner said to him, you must have that violin. The world must hear that violin, and I will sell it to you. You know, our life can be put away to the sidelines. It can be lived out with our own agenda. But you know, if you want the world to really be impacted, our life has to be in the hand of the Master. We have to recognize that we can't go out and pull it off for God. We've got to surrender ourselves to God, and then we will be amazed what God will begin to do through our life. To make that kind of decision, number one, we have to commit ourselves to being a debtor. Recognize that that is already who God has made us to be. I am a debtor. Verse 1, Paul recognized, I am a bondservant. And then in verse 14, he says, I am under obligation, both to Greek and barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. 
Now, in, in our day, we understand what debt is. But most of us are in debt to Visa or MasterCard or Discover Card or whatever other ones we are. We recognize what debt is, what owing something and being responsible to pay on that obligation is. But Paul was saying we have an obligation as the body of Christ in, in probably three areas. Number one, we've got an obligation to Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible says we have been bought with a price, that we are no longer our own. Paul wrote to the Galatian church, I have been crucified with Christ. I am no longer my own. He also said to the Ephesian church, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We like to sing hymns like Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Or love so amazing, so divine, demands my all, my soul, my, lo my life, my soul, my all. We like to sing songs like that, but are we recognizing that is really true? That we do have an obligation, a debt, we do owe it all to Jesus Christ. So I think Paul would say, number one, that we have a debt to Jesus Christ. I think, number two, he would say we have a debt to the heroes of the past and present. To the heroes of the past and present. If you look in Hebrews chapter 11, you have this great long list of people that were faithful. A lot of them made mistakes, but eventually they got their lives in a place, in a setting where God could use them in a tremendous way. Hebrews 12 points back to 11 and says, since we have this great cloud of witnesses, then let us run the race with endurance. Since they have gone before us and been faithful, it's our turn to be faithful as well. Now imagine yourself watching the United States Olympic team running in the relay and they get a little bit behind, and then the third leg of that four-legged relay grabs that baton, runs his heart out, gets them back in the lead right in front of the Russians and the Chinese, hands it off to the fourth leg, and the fourth leg takes it and just kind of strolls. Well, everybody's passing him by. I think every American would stand up in ire, anger, to see somebody take the baton and behave that way. You know, I just wonder what we are doing with the gospel that's been handed off to our generation. You know, I wonder if we are kind of strolling with it. If we've allowed all the distractions around us to kind of take our eyes off the race. I wonder if that cloud of witnesses is just waiting for us to get to heaven so they can give us what's for. Because we haven't been faithful, recognizing the debt we owe to them. They have been so faithful in transferring this opportunity to us. And yet many of us are distracted from the race. And then we have the heroes of the presence. We're surrounded by those around us who are very faithful, who are doing the job, who are out on the playing field, committed to the task. I think it's interesting that, that especially some high school teams, and I guess some college as well, they will suit up maybe over 100 players on a football team. And yet only 11 are out there at any particular time. And probably in the, the scope of the game, maybe a... 30 of them will ever participate in the game, while the rest of them just kind of sit there and, and watch the entire game from the sidelines or from the bench. You know, I just wonder if, if at a point in time, how much it would surprise some of those players if in the middle of the game the coach turned around and said, hey, Jackson, get in the game. And Jackson had never been in the game before. And suddenly the coach is saying, you get in the game. And I could just hear Jackson, if he was like the, the modern church, he might say, well, I'd rather not. Now, that's not my gift, coach. And I'd rather wait for a play that I, I like a little better. You know, why don't you let the younger players uh, play the game instead of me? You know, I've gotten comfortable over here on the bench, on the sideline. I, I like it over here by the, uh, the heater or the cooler, the big fan. You know, I'm more comfortable over here. Why don't you let somebody else? I like sitting back here and kind of watching and commenting on the game. I'd rather not get out there and play myself. The coach is saying, get in the game. That's the reason you put the suit on. That's the reason you're, you're here, is because there's a game going on. And I just wonder if God is saying to a lot in the church today, get in the game. There's a need. There's a need in our Sunday school. There's a need in our Awana. There's a need in our outreach program. There's a need here, a need here. Get in the game. We're sitting back saying, you know, I've gotten awful comfortable to just kind of watching 
the game. I like wearing the uniform. I like being called by the team's uh, title, but I'd rather not step out on the field. Paul is saying we have an obligation to be in the game. An obligation to Jesus Christ, an obligation to heroes of the past and heroes of the present as well. And then he would probably say we have a, 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 a debt or an obligation to the lost as well. Here he describes them as Greeks and barbarians, the wise and the foolish. That, in Paul's language of his day, that covered everybody. That covered both sides of the track. That covered the whole spectrum of the uh, uh, economic field. That covered both the, uh, the high IQs and maybe the, the simpler minded. That covered everybody. What he was saying was we have a debt that doesn't draw, draw any lines anywhere. To every person, no matter what their difference is from us, we have an obligation and a debt to reach out to them. You know, I heard about a, a, a college professor who went to see a rich rancher. They both were a part of the same church, and he went to this rancher to ask if he could help support the college. And this college was a Christian college that was preparing young men and women for, for different parts of, of ministry. And this rich rancher listened to this college professor and finally just made a simple statement. He said, you know, it's really none of my concern. The college professor left. Being a part of the same church, they, were, they came back together at a particular church gathering, and the college professor asked if he could talk to him again and just share a story. And the story he shared with him was of a wagon train full of immigrants that were coming across uh, America, headed toward California from the East Coast, and they hit the great American desert. Being immigrants, they didn't expect it. They weren't prepared for it. They got a few days into it. They were out of water. They are running out of water, very thirsty, very hot. The uh, uh, people were getting sick, the children were crying, the uh, women were overwhelmed, and, and finally the wagon master stopped the wagon. He selected four men. He gave them four fresh horses, and he sent them off in four directions. One went north, one went south, one went east, and one went west. They were to go and to find water. Well, the one that went north went for about two days, and he saw some trees. He rode over to the trees, and there he found a little body of water about the size of an average house. He jumped off his horse. He dove in the water. He drank the water. His horse drank the water. He played in the water. And then finally, after he filled up everything that he had with him full of water, he got back on his horse, was starting to head back south to the wagon train, and he had a thought. His thought was, you know, I have everything I need. Why should I get involved in that situation? And he turned his horse toward California, and off he went. And this college professor said, what would you do? He said to this rich rancher, what would you do with a man like that? Well, the rancher was angry. He said, I would take him and tie him to a wagon wheel, and I would horse whip him within an inch of his life. Then the professor said, what would you do with someone who had the water of life? and refused to share it. And finally it connected. And Paul was trying to connect that message to us as well. You know, the greatest sin that a Christian can commit is the sin of silence. The greatest sin a Christian can commit is the sin of silence. All through the New Testament, we are commanded repeatedly to get out into the world and be witnesses. Acts 1.8 1, says that is the very reason the Holy Spirit comes into to indwell our lives, that we might be witnesses to the very end of the world. That is the last thing Jesus said was the Great Commission, to go into the world and to be witnesses, to make disciples, to baptize them, teaching them all that I commanded you. That is why we, we have been left here. You know, a Christian who won't share their faith is no better than a teacher who won't teach or a soldier who won't fight or a fireman who won't go to a fire. They're missing the very purpose for their existence. You know, some years ago, we were living in Kansas City and the Gulf War broke out. And lo and behold, there was a lady in, in the Kansas side of Kansas City who was a doctor trained by the military who refused to go and serve in the Gulf War. And it was a big, 
big news story, probably made it down here, that she had been trained, was getting all the benefits, but when it came really time to step onto the field to do what she had been given the task to do, she refused to do it. Went through the court system, and, and can you really just kind of take all the benefits, and then when the, the, the time comes to really respond, just say, well, I don't want to do it. I'd rather not. I think a lot of the people in the church are trying to pull that off as well. I want to go to heaven. I want to have a good reputation. But I don't really want to get involved. You know, the fanatics, those are the ones that run that race with all their vigor. I'd kind of like to just enjoy the race. Paul is saying we have a responsibility. 1 Corinthians 9.16, he says, Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. He recognized that defined who he was. The second thing, real quickly, Paul said, not only I am a debtor, but I am ready. Thus, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. You know, here we have uh, all through Scripture telling us to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. It tells us to be ready to make a defense for the hope that lies within us. And I just wonder if somebody came up to you and said, you know, I'm struggling in my life and I feel like I need God in my life. What does it mean to be a Christian? How do I become a Christian? How would you respond to that? Are you ready? Are you prepared? Are you eager to share this good news that you've been given? Or would you say to them, you know, maybe you can come to our church next week and you can sit down with my Sunday school teacher or sit down with our, our pastor or maybe one of our deacons could take time. Maybe I'll have somebody come by your house. Or are you ready? You know, the news is so great and so essential that it can't be passed off for another time. We are to be ready to make a defense at a moment's notice. Now, I might ask you also this morning, are you eager? You may be ready. You may have been through every training that you can imagine. You may have been through Evangelism Explosion, through Master Life, through, through every possible thing. You may have served in the church a lot of years, but as you sit here today, you're not eager. You're not eager. You've lost your passion somewhere. Yeah, you're ready. You're trained, probably more than anybody else in the church, but are you eager? Are you excited to hear God's voice and to respond, to jump when He calls? And a third thing to realize, I guess, about, about being ready and eager is that being a witness, in the Christian sense, means also being a part of the evidence. You go to a court trial and you have the witness who give their testimony, the witnesses who give their testimony, and then you also have the evidence which is meant to substantiate the testimony of the witness. And in the life of a Christian, both are in case there, we are the evidence to the testimony or the witness that we're giving. And if our life is not consistent with the witness we are giving, then it would be like a court case saying, well, the evidence says this and the testimony says that. You can imagine how the jury would be confused. And is your life consistent with the testimony that the gospel gives of Jesus Christ coming in and transforming, renewing a mind, and changing a life? A person who is eager, who is ready to share, is a person who has a platform to share from. And that is to say the power of the gospel can be evident in the way it's changed my life as well. You know, the issue with most people who sit in a church pew from Sunday to Sunday, for most people, is that they have a higher affection for, for themselves, for their time or their money or their reputation than they do for God and for His will. And when, it, when it comes down to it, you might say it this way, I don't give because I love my money more than I love my lost souls. I don't serve because I love my time more than I love lost souls. I don't. I, I love a sin maybe more than I love lost souls. I love that TV program more than I love lost souls. And those aren't evidences of a person having a changed life. Now, I think the bottom line issue is that we are more in love with other things 
than the will of God, than our relationship with God, and that explains why we are the people that we are. We need to be sobered up about where our life is and recognize the changes that need to be made. In World War II, the people who packed parachutes, I heard that they had a, a success uh, level of 19 out of 20, which, you know, that meant one out of 20 didn't open. And that was not acceptable. And the manager tried to figure out how to fix that, and the way he fixed it was he had those who packed the parachutes test their packing job. And amazingly so, the level went from, from 19 out of 20 all the way up to 100% success rate because people put their lives on the line. And we need to get sobered up about where our lives are. Paul said, I count my life not as dear to myself. I count my life not as dear to myself. Could you imagine that being said in America today? That is the very opposite of the American slogan. The American way is to move up the ladder, get all you can get, grab all the gusto you can. It's a very self-oriented message. It's the very opposite of the, of, the, uh, of the message of the gospel, recognizing who we are in Christ and what we owe to a lost world. There was a young girl that was very sick, and this young girl was so desperately sick that, that uh, she would certainly die if she did not get a transfusion of blood. Well, the transfusion of blood was difficult because she had a very, a very rare type of blood. In fact, as they did a search for somebody with that blood, they found nobody except her younger brother. They had not wanted to even include him as a candidate because of his age. But when it came, when they realized that she had no other hope, they finally talked to the younger boy and said, you know, your sister's very sick. She's desperately sick. Her blood is sick. If she doesn't get some new blood in her, then, then she is, she's not going to survive. Well, this little boy listened to this. And he took a long time mulling over it. And then finally he said, well, he was willing to do it. Well, the day came for him to, to be able to transfuse some, uh, you know, not all of his blood, obviously, but enough to kind of sustain her and get her back on the right track. Came. They prepared them both, put them on the table. He was very quiet. The young boy just kind of stared at the, the ceiling, didn't say a word. Finally, after the transfusion was going and it seemed like it had taken a little while, the boy motioned for his dad to come over to him. His dad came over to him. The boy looked up at the dad and said, Dad, when do I die? When do I die? In his mind, he was giving his sister his blood, and that would mean that he would be no longer. But he had come to the decision of being willing to do that. A very costly decision. You know, and it was a hard decision for him. But you know, being a, a Christian is a big decision. Becoming a Christian means total cost. It's meant to be a hard decision decision. It's not going to, I'm going to add Jesus to my life and everything will be, be wonderful. It means you are surrendering your life. It demands your all. You're laying it all on the line. Everything about your life rightfully now belongs to Jesus Christ. And Paul recognized that. And Paul might ask us this morning, what are you willing to do for the gospel? He said he was willing to go and to preach in Rome. He was, he was eager to go preach in Rome. That would have been the hardest place in the world to preach the gospel. Here was the proud Romans. And here Paul would come there and preach this message from a small Roman province. Message that didn't match at all with the way the Romans thought. That could cost him dearly. Yet he said he was eager to go. As you think about this morning, where would be the hardest place for you to go and preach the gospel? Who would be the hardest person for you to share it with? And Paul was saying, you know, that's the hardest, but I'm willing, I'm eager to go and to share the gospel with that person. Let me close by sharing with you. Imagine if you worked for our governor. we got a new one that will be here, I guess, by the end of this fall. But if you worked for the governor in his Tulsa office, and you got a call from the governor's office, and the governor 
called you, part of your job description was to, to be a liaison back from here to McAllister to the prison. And the call came in that so-and-so who's on death row, scheduled to die in a week, that he has been pardoned. And you, there's a fax coming in your office, you're to take that fax, deliver it to, to the, uh, the prison, and that man's life will be pardoned. Well, the fax comes in, and you, are, uh, you put it in your coat pocket, getting ready to head down to McAllister, and your phone rings, and it's your friend. And your friend says, you know, it's, it's almost a weekend. This is Friday morning. You say, we could fly out. We could be in Las Vegas this weekend, and we could spend the weekend in, in Vegas and have a great time. What do you think? we got to leave, though, by, by, by an hour. And you think, well, I've got a whole week to get this down to McAllister, so why don't I do it? And so you pack up, you head to Vegas, you're three weeks in Vegas, you come back. Oh, nobody just doesn't apply to anybody here. You come back, and, and Monday morning, somebody wants to go golfing. Well, let's go up golfing today. Got plenty of time. The next day, well, there's a good movie on. I think I'm going to plan on your thoughts go to going out to that movie that night. The next day, you're thinking about your favorite TV program on that day. It just the time flies by, and you're, you wake up one morning, you pick up the paper, and you read the, in the paper, so-and-so was executed last night at the prison. You're getting ready to go to work, and you've got that jacket, the same jacket, near you. You pick it up, look in the pocket, and there's the part. You never delivered it. You got so involved with these other things that the message went undelivered. And it was costly. Paul recognized that is why we're here. It's like that was why that man worked for the governor. God has left us here with the responsibility to share the message, to deliver the message, the message of the gospel that Jesus Christ, that every man is a sinner, that no person has the hope of heaven by their own righteousness, but God sent his son who lived a perfect life, who died a death he didn't know, and God will impute that righteousness to our account. He became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God through him that God can forgive us of our sins, which are a barrier, a divider to a relationship with Him. But God provided through His Son, Jesus Christ. That message, if undelivered, will cost somebody an eternity. I'm going to ask you